What's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of the Post Game Podcast. I'm your host, Corey Smith. I'm here, as always, with Brian Geisinger. Brian, a uh, huge win for NC State today. I don't think it, you know, sometimes it seems like hyperbole. We're just talking about, oh, here's the reasons why it's huge. We don't have to give any explanation for this one. I mean, a win over Duke, the number 11 team in the country, number two team in the ACC. Uh, they continue to advance it and keep this run going. First time a team has gone, you know, from Tuesday all the way into Friday now at this point. Uh, there's a chance BC could do the same thing. I'm sitting here watching that game, and uh, UVA has, has figured out how to do the offense thing again. But uh, it's, it's, it's a close game there, too. But um, first of all, I mean, just your thoughts on this win for NC State and, uh, and what you saw. It's incredible. Like, I mean, this has got to be one of the biggest wins since Kevin Keats got to Raleigh. Um, yeah. Like, not just first, for this it's season. It's the first ACC tournament semifinals appearance for him. First one for NC State in 10 years now at this point, since 2014. And he comes against a top, a top 10 team that beat yeah. them 10 days ago. Um, you know, top 10 team in terms of adjusted efficiency margin. You know, whether you're using Ken Palm or Bartorvik, a, a team that's got a couple future pros on it. And um, in State was just like right there with them, The you know, kind of the entire game. Um, and as, again, we pointed him out last night, but just can't say enough about Mo Diara. Like this, I know we'll talk about him more, but to me, this is some real like heart of a champion type stuff from for, for Mo Diara, who um, is fasting uh, throughout the day, can't drink water as he's observing Ramadan. And then he comes out and then just empties the bucket while guarding Kyle Filipowski, switching out onto Duke's guards uh, all over the glass, 16 rebounds tonight. <laughs> Uh, making plays in the Insane. open floor, hitting corner threes. Like the guy is just um, – he's been one of the best players in the tournament so far, like without a doubt. And, he, I mean, coming off a, a strong finish to the season for him. And I just – I don't think you can say enough because, like, I think, you know, the guards have gotten hot shooting the basketball. That's a big deal. And, and DJ Horn's playing through the, the hip injury and giving them big-time offense on the perimeter. But, like – Everything is like being pieced together by Diara. I, I really think like the work on the glass, the versatility, and and kind of just like his speed in the front court and his his length in the front court have been huge, huge difference uh, makers for this team. And um, how he's doing it, I, I honestly have no idea. But um, salute to him. Salute to State's you know medical nutrition staff. That's that's you know having him ready to go. And uh, because he's been he's been incredible. And I thought the game plan tonight, how he was deployed defensively was really, really uh, solid and was well executed from uh, uh, by the by the Wolfpack. Yeah, we'll get into all that. Obviously, a bunch to talk about. Mo DR being one DJ Horn, another gutsy performance from him. 18 points overall from him. Uh, just say, I mean, like what we're seeing from these guys, and I actually asked DJ Horn about this. I was like, how much credit do you give to the trainers now at this point for not only getting you ready, <laughs> but for keeping Mo Diara's energy level high enough, keeping him his stamina high enough after after not eating all day long. I mean, it's from it's from sun up to sundown uh, that he's not allowed to eat. And uh, man, you know, it's funny when he checks out <laughs> that first time. Uh, you're, you're seeing him just like, hey, sun, uh, sunset. He's just shoving down bananas and and like you know applesauce, Smoothies, like all stuff. Gatorade, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then he's like, all right, five minutes, I'm right back in. So uh, yeah, it's it's crazy to see that. And uh, you know, if we we talk about the fatigue. I see a, a question here from Rusty. He says, uh, how will they counteract the fatigue of multiple games and multiple days? Well, <laughs> first of all, you might end up being play. You might end up playing BC. We'll see here in just a little bit. Another team that has played three games in three days. Uh, also, uh, it's amazing that you're able to do that uh, with with the fact that, you know, like we said, a guy like Mo Diara, uh, one of your biggest contributors, your highest energy guys that's it's been in this tournament uh, and basically playing off adrenaline at this point uh, yeah. with him. And the one the one thing I will say that you can counteract that as well, uh, the fact that they play at 930 tomorrow night. So he will actually be able to eat pregame and be, <laughs> yeah. and be ready for what a, what a concept and like i mean it's it's important to note like if they play boston college it's a big if at this point but he is the linchpin for them to guarding quentin post who is the you know the, the he's the hub of boston college's offense he's everything flows through him his shooting his spacing his post-up game um his the passing he provides 
you know, with five out or from the elbow at seven feet tall, like Diara's the guy that has is is tasked with being the primary defender on him and being the guy that switches out on Boston College's guards. That's if it's BC, it's sort of a different story, you know, if it's Virginia and he gets to, you know, guard Ryan Dunn and sort of um almost maybe even do what uh kind of like what state was doing with Mark Mitchell tonight with DJ yeah. Burns guarding him, just sort of like having him sort of sag off and, and play in the paint and then try to help out on um Kyle Filipowski post-ups when a guard would get switched on to him. But we we can get into you know any part of this game. I'm happy to uh talk about whatever here. What but yeah, crazy. I thought um I kept waiting for Duke to sort of like make a make the run in the second half. Um foul and trouble. They, did. I mean, they made several runs, but NC they, State just continued to answer. Yeah. Yeah, they did. And I mean, I think the foul trouble of Filipowski, McCain played huge roles. I mean, I know those guys still played 34 minutes a piece, but like as soon as one of them was on the bench and there was a stretch, I think in the second half when both guys were on the bench and all, I mean, immediate, immediate NC state run. Um, yeah. They just couldn't find all, they couldn't find offense um, elsewhere. And then you got TJ power in there. He's having trouble state guarding on the perimeter. Um, and it was a tough game for Ryan young as the backup center for, uh, for Duke. But yes, I mean, Duke got zero points. Um, and only a couple of rebounds from its bench performers. It was the starting five, and, uh, you know, State was able to lean on the bench. Bringing in DJ Horn as the sort of, like, microwave guy off the bench is like also, like, maybe letting some guys settle into place with the starting lineup a little bit. Like, maybe that's helping, uh, you know, O'Connell and, and Taylor find their spots, and then you bring Horn in, and all of a sudden you got – you can start running offense through uh, through DJ. And – um I don't know. Like they're not splitting the atom. Like this is this is they're largely like playing very similar to how they have all season. I just think Diara's like will <laughs> and and then really like the the offensive creation of Burns and Horn is just like kind of carrying the day. I mean maybe they're getting better shooting from O'Connell and Taylor. Um, those guys you know both had each hit a couple of threes tonight. But a lot of this is the same formula. They're just sort of like executing it better. Yeah. Well, before we really get things started, I want to remind our listeners, as always, visit our iTunes, Google Play Store, if you and give us a rating if you enjoy the podcast. Also, make sure to check us out on YouTube if you're watching this, which I see, uh, you know, between YouTube and Facebook, we've got over 100 people in here uh, checking us out. A few more than we've had in the past, so I uh, appreciate you guys for jumping in. I know, obviously, it's a lot more exciting to talk about a win for NC State. Uh, and then, as always, guys, uh, make sure that you check out all of Pack Pride's coverage. Uh, throughout the rest of basketball season, however long this thing lasts, we don't even know at this point. I mean, every single time we talk, it's like, all right, well, uh, you know, one more game, and then and we'll see hmm. what happens after that. And, uh, and it just keeps running. It just keeps going. It's a, it's a great run to cover. It's been a lot of fun. I got to find a new hotel room for tomorrow night. I, I booked it all the way through Friday thinking like, all right, <laughs> we'll, just we'll just see what happens. And, uh, and man, it's been it's been great to be able to cover this run. Uh, but do make sure that you check out our coverage. I mean, it's a dollar <laughs> for the first month as always, but also right now we're running a deal 50% off. That's for new or monthly subscribers. So if you're somebody that already subscribes on a monthly basis, you can upgrade get a full year for 50% off. That's six months for absolutely free. Uh, if you've never done it before, please make sure that you check it out. Uh, not only are we covering this, we also had somebody out at Paul McNeil's uh, playoff game tonight. We'll have an interview with him plus photos for you guys to check out. And then we'll also have, uh, you know, Michael Clark was out on the road today covering football recruits. So uh, we've got all that going on as well. So plenty for you guys to jump into it and, and check out over at Pack Pride. So please make sure that you actually go there uh, as well as listening to the podcast. So thank you to everybody uh, that is listening. Just want to make sure we get everybody over there. Uh, man, I got to <laughs> I gotta ask you a question here. I got to, you know, I'm, I'm seeing a, a couple people uh, you know, kind of throwing in here, uh, you know, you, you gave you gave a lot of love to Duke last night, uh, saying, you know, there's a national championship potential. <laughs> uh, seeing some people, you know, kind of saying like, hey, Brian, your scout from yesterday. This was Matt. He said was all pro Duke. Uh, did not even acknowledge an upset. Uh, Duke is soft. You missed completely. Look, I, I want to say this. Like, I mean, your Duke uh, scout was about the same as it was last week. We're talking about, you know, a team that that, you know, beat NC State by 15 just last week, uh, this team also, you know, comes out tonight 
Yes, NC State, I think the biggest thing for NC State was coming out and getting off to a strong start, uh, something that I think you know they were able to do the first time around, but this was a Duke team that came in extremely hungry, and NC State was able to you know, kind of counteract anything and everything they did. And then you know the second half start, too, you've, you've seen this team get out to some, some early leads and then just really struggle uh, in the second half to be able to continue those things. I mean, <laughs> What was the biggest thing that you felt like NC State was able to do in this game that that gave them, you know, not only a win, but, you know, kept them out front for most of this game? I mean, I, I got to go back and look at it. I'll try to find exact minutes. But, man, it felt like for the most part they were out ahead for most of this game. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, Matt, like I, I was wrong. I mean, I thought Duke was gonna. Win. I did think Duke was going to win this game tonight. They were they were favored by 10 points coming into the game. Um, yeah. And. They're really good. Like they, that's a very good team. Um, I don't. I would push back a little bit. I don't, I don't actually. I think. Say, can I? Can I add this really quickly? Yeah. To, to anybody that is discrediting this Duke team, or anybody that's saying, "Hey, this Duke team is soft," you're also diminishing what NC State just accomplished. <laughs> like, you're also just saying, "Like, hey, this isn't a very good Duke team." It is actually a very good Duke team. It's the number eleven team in the country. I mean, there's a lot of teams that have some flaws. But, like, this Duke team has found ways to win some really big games. Yes, they just lost to UNC. This is the first time since, I think it was 2004, 2007, I can't remember the exact number, that they're going to enter the NCAA tournament on a losing streak. But still, like, this is a very good Duke team that NC State just knocked off with a really strong performance from start to finish. Yeah, and look, like, sometimes 5 of 20 on threes happens, right? Like, Duke Duke made Duke missed 15 threes tonight. Um Just not NC State. They beat Wake without even making one. Yeah. And, and that's gonna be tough. Also, Duke held under one point, uh, one point per possession in this game for the first time since uh January 6th against Notre Dame. Um, this is probably one of the better defensive defensive performances that state has had in some time when scaling mm-hmm. for opponent. In as I've said, uh the last couple of weeks um from the clemson game through the pittsburgh games that was the final like seven or eight games of the regular season all but one of those games state got torched defensively in that um and especially the last game against duke that was their worst defensive game of the season but the ones against Pitt, the ones against fsu were also quite bad and they've had probably their two two of their best defensive performances of the season and back-to-back games against Syracuse and against Duke, which is like a, a, a much more difficult opponent to prepare for than uh, than Syracuse. But um, if I were to sort of like point out reasons why, like the reason why I started with Mo Diara at the top is because they used him as the primary defender on Kyle Filipowski and then had him out switching out onto J- Jeremy Roach, Tyrese Proctor, Jared McCain. So that puts a smaller player on Kyle Filipowski. Um, Kyle Filipowski goes into the post. Modiar is able to hang in front of the you know the Duke perimeter player on on the on the perimeter. Filipowski goes into the post. You can see Duke throughout the game. They're trying to high low the ball into him, and so they either need you know uh, it was usually Mark Mitchell. I think there was one possession earlier in the game. It was Ryan Young. They're trying to get those guys to flash to the elbow. Um, or, or even sort of like flash like to the top of the key so they can catch ball swings, flip Filipowski seals against the smaller defender, and then you can lob it over the top. But DJ Burns, who is the primary guy on Mark Mitchell, he's he's in the paint. Like he's playing way off of Mitchell. And, uh, you know, Mark hit a couple of jump shots, a couple of threes, and a, I guess a corner two as well with Duke going with that strategy. And Filipowski and Mitchell still had big games, but like I think for the most part, like it kept out, it kept the easiest um, possible looks from Filipowski out, kept the ball out of his hands. And it sort of got the ball stuck occasionally with Duke's offense. I thought those were like, that was a huge, huge part of this game. Um, At times, Duke tried to pivot and then started running pick and roll offense with Mitchell as the screener. You could see them. In the first half, they went three straight possessions. They went continuity ball screen offense, empty side pick and roll with Mark Mitchell screening. DJ Burns got burnt on the first one, and on the next two, he was he was in the right place and like made a nice play. Um, so like I give I give some credit to DJ DJ Burns like moving his feet, being active with his hands there. But um, really, I just thought the game plan, uh, the scout from State was like was good. I think they benefited some from Duke's two key guys on offense 
being in foul trouble with Flip and uh, and McCain. But, yeah, I don't know. I just didn't think State had this level to hit defensively against that quality of, uh, of opponent. And uh, they totally proved me wrong. Um, and uh, I don't know if there was anything, you know, being there, Corey, that jumped out to you as far as, like, State, their talk defensively, how they're rotating around. Was there anything that you sort of got from, from being uh, on hand in D.C.? Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing that I noticed from this game, too, was just, again, the continued confidence of the guards, uh, their ability to drive inside. Obviously, you know, you want for all these guys to be able to hit those three pointers. And, uh, you know, there's there was there's quite a few. I mean, Jaden Taylor didn't have his his best game tonight, but he hit two really big three pointers. Uh, and then Michael O'Connell, the biggest thing that I took away from this, and I mean, obviously you can kind of tell it on TV for the most part, but you can feel the energy. And and the bench really had to kind of bring it for NC State too because they were extremely outnumbered, uh, especially in the first half. And then you had some UVA fans. You had some, you know, some UNC fans, I would say, even potentially kind of rooting for NC State uh, that were sitting there watching because they're going, man, we just want Duke out at this point. Uh, we don't want to see this Duke team. Uh, you know, over the weekend or on or tomorrow, anything along those lines. And, you know, the first half, it just felt like, you know, the bench was bringing the energy, um, but it felt like, you know, each and every single time they were able to kind of slow things back down, get under control. That's something that we've seen this NC State team do is they try so hard sometimes to speed things up because they're down or because they're trying to get, you know, you know, fool the defense in some way, shape, or form. But they trust this half-court offense right now. It feels like they really just kind of trust in each other. Like, hey, it, it, you know, if we don't make a shot, Mo Diara is going to be there to get the rebound. If we, you know, if he's not there to get the rebound, somebody else will pick it up. Now, granted, nobody other than Mo Diara had more than four rebounds tonight. But there has been other, <laughs> other situations where, like, Jaden Taylor had eight yesterday. Uh, it's been, you know, it's been really, really... I guess kind of reassuring to see this team really just have belief in each other now at this point and, and know that, Hey, we're going to be able to get into our offensive sets. We're going to be able to you know get shots off and get open looks. Um, and that's something that, you know, hasn't been there for this team throughout the season. Uh, and one of the thing I wanted to point out here too, I uh, had a, uh, had a point here that was brought up. Uh, Kit said, guards are the clear answer. Corey uh, totally outplayed them defensively and offensively. And I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, obviously, you know, the last time around, the biggest thing that I, I saw was not only, you know, the offensive performances, Michael O'Connell, five of seven, finishes with 12 points. Casey Morsell, you know, missed some shots early, but hit some big shots down the stretch, especially that one big dunk uh, that he had, 11 points for him. And then, you know, as we pointed out, DJ Horn coming off the bench with 18 points, seven of 13 shooting from him. But the other thing that I, I really noticed from this team was, you know, treasuring each and every single possession, not giving up the, uh, you know, not giving up the basketball because the last time around these two these two teams played, Duke got 20 points, uh, whereas NC State only had seven uh, points off turnovers. Tonight, it was, uh, let's see, I'm trying to pull it back up to make sure I get it right here. Duke had nine points off of turnovers. Uh, NC State had eight, and, and one of the reasons for that, a turnover that happened, obviously, you know, the, the very end there, they make that free throw after Ben Middlebrooks, for whatever reason, missed that dunk. Extremely embarrassing moment. <laughs> yeah, that one really that one sucked for him. And then he gets a technical foul on top of it. But that, yeah. that was, one, that was the, the final point that kind of put Duke over the top to have nine points off of turnover. So, again, you just didn't make – you didn't see this team, despite the fact that they played three games in three days, and they will play four games in four days tomorrow, making mental mistakes. And that's something that has plagued this team all season long. Uh, they didn't make mistakes down the stretch, and they continued to counter each and everything that Duke did. Yeah, you. I mean, the low turnovers again were, were like that's that is to me like um, the hallmark of this of this program under Keith. Yep. Um, nine turnovers tonight, thirteen percent turnover rate. Um, that continues to be the thing. Or part of me, part of me. Yeah, nine turnovers tonight, thirteen percent turnover rate. Duke had the same same numbers. Um, but uh, that continues to be like the foundation for them offensively. And then you factor in Burns making plays out of the post, um, O'Connell in the secondary, the hit ahead passes, and then DJ Horn, the tough shot making. Um, and I want to get to Horn in a second, but like Jaden Taylor hit a shot in the first half where uh, he started in the corner, the left corner, 
they ran like a little handoff pistol action and then sent him into the, you know, staggered ball screen. So it was like a little, little pistol 77 action. Sean Stewart from Duke switches out on him. And Taylor just off the off the bounce, you know, hits a NBA range three off the dribble. So his confidence, um, you know, maybe he didn't have the best shooting game overall tonight, but hit two threes tonight, a um, couple assists. So just like he's given them the secondary playmaking and shot making uh, that they need to 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 accompany Horn. And you know, I've, I know we we started tonight talking about Diara. Have to sing his praises. But what Horn is doing as uh, you know an, a, an undersized guard with a with a tough with a you know a hip injury right now, I just thought he hit some just like not even like dagger style threes, but ones that just like anytime you thought Duke might start to like make a run or or kind of like really chip into this, Horn just hit shots that sort of like steadied everything. Um, they had a with about 16 minutes to go in the first half. So like the first first frame of the game, uh, it's like Filipowski has the ball. Like he cuts down to the post. Um, he tries to make a quick like post to post pass to Sean Stewart. Stewart can't handle the pass. Turnover goes down. DJ Horn three. Uh, very next possession, Duke scores um, with a with a Tyrese Proctor lob to to Filipowski on the high low. And then on the next possession, it's late in the shot clock for NC State. You got Jared McCain guarding DJ Horn in space. And Horn just sort of through his guile and his craft. And, and obviously, like guys who guard him are always worried about his off dribble, you know, step back shot. He's able to sort of like rock and roll, get downhill, get to the right. It's a really tough two. I think he maybe even got fouled on that play with about 15 minutes to go in the uh in the first half. And then on the last play of um, the last play of the first half, it's about what 14 seconds left. Kevin Keats calls a timeout, baseline out of bounds. They run floppy action uh, for DJ Horn. He curls off the two staggered screens to his right. Mark Mitchell switches out, and he hit just a ridiculous shot, right? Like, and that's one of those things where, like, exactly. sort of like. Yeah. Fading, leading runner from the mid range, and that's one of those things where you're just like, you know, good offense beats, you know, great offense beats good defense because like that's what Duke wants. They want Mitchell switched out there. They got it. He forced a tough shot. DJ Horn makes it. Um, I also really thought, like as far as like O'Connell goes, you could see Duke trying to um, like sort of, sort of like selectively throw double teams at Burns. I think there was one time where Jared McCain kind of with like, I think it was with about, it was under two minutes in the first half. State runs a little action. They throw it to Burns in the post. Um, Burns actually missed the shot. It was like a two-point shot. He misses it. Jared McCain came with a late double team, and he left Michael O'Connell yeah. um, on the possession. And I thought – in the second half when Duke was trying to like selectively help off of him, um, like he made, he made him pay. Like he had some, he had a huge three on the right wing. Um, there were a few other shots he hit where Burns, you know, skipped it over to him. Um, and that's tough. Like I give him a ton of credit because like, it's one thing to be left open. It's another thing when a team sort of like what state was doing with Mark Mitchell, where you're like intentionally challenging them. Yeah. Him. And, uh, you know, you start if you miss one or two of those, it can probably start to feel pretty lonely pretty quickly. And uh, for O'Connell to sort of like step in and hit some huge shots, I mean, he he played incredible tonight. I think I don't know what he's shooting from three in the tournament now, but yeah, one of three against Louisville, three of three against Syracuse, two of two against uh, against Duke. Duke. Yeah. O'Connell's been awesome. Four assists, no turnovers. Like he was, um, he he was terrific tonight for State. So I do want to like. Uh, the commenter brought up the guards, and, and so I wanted to sort of like touch on Taylor, Horn, and uh, O'Connell right there. Yeah, and I was about to, uh, I was actually about to point out uh, Winston's comment here. He said, he said, MOC, Michael O'Connell getting over screens the past two games has been huge. He said, I love Mo and, and it being an X factor, but give credit to, to Michael O'Connell. Uh, he's been a huge lift in this tournament. He needs more credit. Yeah, and I mean, you know, as you just said, you know, we're, we're pointing out, you know, all the all the you know efficiency numbers for him. Uh, but man, I mean, you know, it's not just outside of the arc. It's five of nine against Louisville. It's four of six against 
uh, Syracuse in the five of seven. That's the overall shooting number. So, like, anytime they're challenging him, he's hitting those shots, and he's had three-plus assists in each and every single one of those games. He had 16 against Louisville, 16 against Syracuse, 12 uh, tonight against Duke. And, and again, you know, you need that type of scoring. You need those complete efforts because – Here's the thing is if you're leaning on a DJ Horn constantly, if you're leaning on a DJ Burns constantly, if you're if you're needing, you know, a Jaden Taylor to hit, you know, four threes for you in a game, that's going to, you know, that's going to lead to each one of those guys getting worn down. I think that's what's led to this team being able to make this deep run is the fact that so many guys are scoring, the fact that you can lean on so many other guys. I mean, you saw Ben Middlebrook 16, uh, 16 minutes off the bench tonight, you know, Breon Pass only getting one minute. So this was probably the most we've seen, you know, this team kind of exert all those five starters and then obviously DJ Horn off the bench. But I mean, you know, you, you're kind of at the point where you have to do that now, and every team's going to have to do that now. So it's not like you're just saying, hey, we, <laughs> let's let's just keep uh, throwing these guys out there. They're exhausted, and we're going to have to wear them down. But, yeah, that's that's kind of where things are. And I think uh, right now, you know, that's you're, you're at the point now where it's going to be all driven by adrenaline over these next, uh, you know, two nights, potentially, if NC State is able to win tomorrow against either BC or, or UVA, which right now 731 left to go, BC up by two. Uh, still over UVA, so yeah. O'Connell, O'Connell's point of attack defense has been awesome. Um, really, really good. It was good against Judah Mintz and Syracuse the previous night, and he was awesome against a bunch of really good guards from Duke this evening. Um, and we didn't really touch on Morcel much, but I just did want to say there were two two plays he had. They may have been on back to back possessions in the second half, like about 11, 10 minutes to play where um, there was a scramble situation. He drove uh, drove left, got fouled, scored. It was Jared McCain's fourth foul. I thought that was a big play. Um, and then about a minute later was that other sort of like weird scramble situation, which led to the uh, the Morcell dunk on, on kind of like a, a broken play. But just, you know, look, they needed Casey to get downhill on a couple of possessions tonight, and he was, uh, he was able to do so. Everyone – Everyone who saw action, you know, extended minutes tonight played, you know, did their job. And so, I don't know, we gave all the other guards praise. Those were two huge swing possessions, um, you know, for for State. And, and Morcell provided them by scoring twice at the rim and also getting another foul on uh, Jared McCain. Yeah, he had <laughs> – Casey Morcell alone had three dunks tonight. Uh, the one coming out the gate uh, to start the second half. Uh, and then the you know the dunk at the 1024 mark and then the final one that he had uh, that you were just talking about at the 620 mark uh, made it a 62 to 52 game at that point put it, NC State up by 10 and he hits a layup a little bit he hits a layup on the very next possession which you were talking about to keep NC State up by 10 and that was the biggest thing to me was like you know I kept bringing it up in the locker room to every single guy about you know every single haymaker that it felt like Duke was trying to throw at NC State um, man they just you know they continued to uh they continue to be able to answer those things. It just as as much as we've talked about all off season about this team not being up for big games, not being able to close big games, having lapses. You know, you think back to the UNC game, fifteen straight missed shots. You think back to the Duke game, too many defensive breakdowns. Virginia Tech, BYU, a lot of defensive breakdowns in the second halves. This team just didn't have those types of things uh, tonight. Hasn't had them throughout this tournament. And, and I have to, you know, as much as people are going to discredit, uh, you know, what, what Kevin Keats is doing, I mean, this just feels like a different team. And, and as much as I haven't want to, to write about it because I feel like people are going to see it sarcastically, you know, there's there's a real sense of belief not only in this team, but also, you know, the fan base kind of getting behind these guys finally after, after a win tonight because you're kind of seeing things potentially open up for this team to – you know, to maybe even be able to get to Saturday now at this point. Yeah, I mean, they've whomever they play in the semifinals, like they've they've beaten both those teams this season. So it's like they can do it. They've got a, a blueprint for how to contend against Boston College or how to handle post. And if they end up getting BC, yeah, you know, we'll see what what Earl Grant has in terms of counters for that. Um, if it's Virginia. You've got to deal with – you've got to handle Reese Beekman, you know, probably being the primary guy on DJ Horn. That's tough. He's – you know, Beekman's probably the best point of attack and, you know, guard defender in the ACC. And 
probably up there with Jamal Shedd as far as like point of attack defenders go in the country. Um, so special player, you got Ryan Dunn floating around out there trying to block shots. Um, but there's some stuff state can do if it is, you know, UVA there, there's like a roadmap for them in that matchup too. Um, it's just like getting, keeping everyone healthy, keeping everyone, uh, you know, like locked in. And, um, I mean, I don't know. It's like the hope is that also, can you keep Michael O'Connell? Like, you know, he's going to give you the defense, the transition, uh, you know, initiation, like, you know, all that stuff's going to be there, but like, can he and Taylor continue to hit perimeter shots? Because like Horn and Burns can give you an offensive foundation and stuff to play off of. And Horn can pick and roll. He can come off down screens. You see him on a lot of these baseline out of bounds plays. It's when he's coming off of a screen. It's happening against Syracuse too. Two guys go to him coming off a pick, and that guy who's at the screen for him is able to slip or dive to the rim, um, you know, like uncontested in the lane. So uh, his versatility as a as like a guard scorer, Burns who, by the way, now up to 24% assist rate this season. Like he's just been, he's been such a good, such a good passer out of the post. Um, But if you can get the secondary scoring and and shot making from uh, the, 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 the other three main guards like that, that's kind of the difference for them. I think at least, at least as far as like the half court offense goes. Um, And then defensively, like, you know, I mean, this is as good as they've played all season defensively, and yeah. I'm not sure how to like. I mean, we've we we sort of I sort of ran through like scheme wise what they were doing, and and I, and again, I think DJ Horn you got to get or DJ Burns you got to give him a tip of the cap like for for hanging in there with some tough assignments at times in this game. Um, all of state's guard defenders for being willing to hang with Filipowski on switches. But like it's not like those guys weren't trying and doing stuff like that this season. They're just, I don't know, man. Sometimes it's like it's not even as much as I even like to obsess over adjustments and changes and all that sort of stuff. Like a lot of times it comes down to matchups and like how well you execute. And like sometimes that's not like, you know, depends on if you're looking through that through like a results-based thing or a process thing or whatever. But um yeah, I just didn't think they 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 could get to this level uh, defensively. We'll see if they can do it for a for a third straight game here, or pardon me, for a fourth straight game. <laughs> I mean, I guess I guess I should say the defense was not great against Louisville, but it, it was, was really yeah. it was really good against Syracuse and, and Duke. And, since uh, about the since about the ten minute mark in the first half of the Louisville game, NC <laughs> State's yeah. defense has been very good ever yeah. since that point. Um, yeah, and you know, again, uh, it's. It's funny because, like, kind of, I, I get kind of what you're saying too. Is it's like, it's not so much that Kevin Keats is coaching different, or you know, the staff is coaching different. It's that guys are are finally doing the things that that you're asking them to do, and they're all doing it at the same time. I mean, you're just seeing a bunch of guys playing all the roles that they've been asking them to play all season long, and it's all coming together, you know, quite beautifully. To, if we're being honest, I mean. Yeah. You know, yes, it's not a you know it wasn't a blowout win for NC State, but man, you know this this Duke team for as much as people are calling them soft or calling you know calling NC State, yeah. uh, you know this is an upset or whatever. I mean, they were a ten point favorite for a reason. NC State was expected to come into this game exhausted. Duke was expected to come into this game as the better, more athletic, uh, you know, deeper team, uh, and NC State was able to uh, <laughs> to. I mean, look, I'm I'm also looking at the bench points here, and obviously. Uh, for NC State, you know, a lot of that was because of DJ Horn coming off the bench, but they yeah. win the bench point 21 to zero. I mean, in the first game for Duke, they were forced to play their five starters, each and every single one of them, over 34 minutes. Uh, so, yes, you know, NC State was the team that's supposed to come in more exhausted, but uh, they forced Duke's hand to, to make them keep uh, as many of those guys on the court as much as they possibly could. And, uh, and they were able to, you know, they were able to thrive once, like you said, Filipowski came off or McCain came off. Uh, they they really were able to find their footing and and again, from start to finish, you put together a complete game defensively, offensively. You don't make the mistakes you did in the last game because if you go back and look at the numbers from the last game, they're actually pretty close. Both teams were pretty close. It was just that Duke got a lot more shots off because they forced the hand. They were able to get rebounds. They forced NC State to a lot of turnovers, and NC State didn't make those mistakes tonight. Um, so yeah, you know, I got a question here from Winston. He said, is this the best coaching we've seen from KK and, uh, you know, Kevin Keats, obviously, uh, in seven years? 
I don't know. I don't think so. I think it's again, you know, the 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 reason why last year's team was so successful was because a lot of guys bought into their roles. A lot of guys bought into, hey, you know, Traquavion Smith is going to be the prime, you know, the primary shooter. Jarkel Joyner is going to be the primary ball handler. You're seeing, you know, Michael O'Connell uh, play with some poise uh, over these last three games. You're seeing, you know, DJ Horn being able to get to the lane, being able to hit, you know, big shots and hit big threes. Uh, you're seeing Jaden Taylor, you know, not always, you know, efficient, but consistently being able to hit big shots. Uh, and then I had a comment here from uh, from Bart. He said uh, O'Connell is throwing rainbows. He's changed his shot for the better. Uh, it's funny. I actually asked him about that. He said he's gotten a bunch of questions from, you know, <laughs> other guys on the team like, hey, what what what's going on with your shot? Uh, and he said, I didn't feel like I changed it, but it's just falling. So I'm going to keep shooting it. Uh, and, and, yeah, I mean, you know, when you go five of five over the last two uh, games, uh, from three point range, you're not asking him to shoot a lot, but you're just asking him to he, make some of those. Yeah, he, that the when he can hit like spot shots, it doesn't. It's not even been like you know you need O'Connell to be this like you know pull up shooting, yeah. uh, you know uh, star or anything like that. Like you got like that's that DJ Horns there for that, but just O'Connell being able to hit like spot up threes, you know catch and shoot threes because he does so much. Like he's already a good player, right? And he yeah. already does so much good stuff defensively. Uh, you know, getting the secondary and transition game going, the way he moves without the ball as a cutter in the half court, he sort of like mitigates some of the like you know shooting limitations. But all of a sudden, like if he can just be a good catch and shoot guy on, on the second side, it it makes him. I mean, it makes him a very very good player. <laughs> like it, it it just raises his. Uh, his ceiling as an, as a, as an offensive player, like dramatically and that in turn, like really boost state's half court offense too. So um, yeah, I mean, they need him to keep, they need him to do it again tomorrow, regardless of whom the opponent is, because like that's becoming a, a pretty crucial part and they need him to keep bringing it at the point of attack defensively and you know, switching around. And, and, uh, and then when Mo Diara grabs an offensive rebound, like getting ready to get state going in, in, uh, in transition too. Yeah, and I've got a couple of people here pointing out, you know, I said this was a <laughs> this was the game where NC State didn't necessarily blow Duke out or, or run away with it. Uh, and David is pointing out some pretty good points here. He said breaking free throws at the end, uh, hit four of them, and, and NC State wins by, you know, wins by, you know, well, I guess that would have been nine points right there. Uh, and they, you know, they did miss quite a few down the stretch. You know, we've seen that at times rear its ugly head. But yeah, I mean, 55% free throw shooting on the night. Not great. But when you, you know, when you have as efficient of an offense as they did, uh, it kind of covers that up. And that's been the thing is it's like you've needed the free throws at times to cover up an inefficient offense. And tonight it was the opposite. Uh, yeah. Art said the same thing. He said, you know, it was a blowout except for seven missed free throws at the end. Uh, dunk. And a tech, <laughs> you missed a dunk and the, and the technical foul to give Duke a, a free throw on the other end. So just a, a weird, you know, ending. But again, NC State able to withstand all those things too. Yeah, the I mean, the Middlebrooks dunk was. A, a, I'm sure, like a lot of people's heads just started like rolling off of their shoulders, like as that as that happened. Um, you, you certainly kind of feel bad for him. Like, I mean, that's a dunk yeah. that he makes 99 out of a hundred times. He's a really good player. Um, but I think more than anything was that they actually, you know, they got to the line and this wasn't some crazy, you know, they obviously they missed a, a fair share of free throws tonight, but to me, the um, ha having that many attempts and like that, uh, you know, a plus 30 free throw attempt rate um, is speaks to a team that's getting the ball into the paint, getting the ball to the post um, or, and also, you know, playing with a lead late in the game too. And, and therefore like, you know, getting some, uh, you know, some sort of like end of game fouls too, but just like that is an indicator to keep, to always track for NC state, really any team, but I think a team like state that is so that too often this year has been like reliant on like mid range twos that what the free throw rate is an indicator of is just like get, they're getting easier points and it probably means they're getting the ball to the rim more frequently too. So um, yeah, even though they missed nine free throws tonight, getting the, getting the 20 attempts uh, was uh, substantial for them. All right. Well, I was hoping that maybe uh, we'd be at the end of this, uh, this Virginia or BC game. Uh, and maybe we'd be able to figure out who exactly was winning by that point, who was going to run away with it. Uh, but as we know, Virginia, uh, the offensive <laughs> juggernaut that they are, 
uh, you know, not able to to quite withstand what uh, what BC's throwing at them. It's 55 to 53. So I'm going to throw this out. Uh, your thoughts on on either one of these games or, you know, how NC State matches up with them, because obviously, you know, they've beaten they've faced both of these teams twice. Uh, BC, they were able to beat twice, once at home, once on the road. Uh, and then, you know, when it came to UVA uh, as a team, they beat handily at home. UVA kind of figured their things out. They ran into, you know, a UVA team that was actually playing some really good basketball and they forced them into overtime after a, a crazy comeback there at the end that if, if I still sitting on the sitting at the third level there watching uh, that ball in flight from Casey Morcell from the <laughs> right side all the way in. I was just like, man, that thing's going to fall, and it just barely dinks off. They lose in overtime. This feels like, you know, both of these teams are, are teams that NC State matches up really well with. What are your thoughts on, on either one of these? And maybe start with BC, uh, given the fact that I'm just going to give them the advantage here. They're leading right now. <laughs> Yeah, well, the we've talked about them, uh, you know, after the Syracuse game, we'll talk about them here now, too. But just like you, you'd be hard pressed to find a team that did like a better job against Quinton Post this season. Yeah. Uh, the first time state plays, it's, it's a, you know, an overtime game. Uh, Post scores uh, 18 points in the game, but 0 of 2 on threes, uh, four turnovers in that game. Then they play again you know, towards the end of February, um, Quentin Post in that game, six points, one of six on twos, doesn't attempt a single three uh, in 20 minutes and had a couple of turnovers too. I just think State does a really nice job with Mo Diara. Again, I, I, forgive me for just bringing this up again, but him, him, what like he did tonight, being the primary defender on Filipowski, his ability to switch out, and hang with any of Boston College's guards. And, like, they've got some, you know, Claudel Harris, uh, Jaden Zachary, Madsen. Like, they've got some decent guards. I mean, but, do, yeah. yeah, exactly. In, but but they're not as – they're not quite as, like, terrifying as, you know, Roach, McCain, or or R.J. Davis. And, you know, like, those kinds of, like, real, like, high-end guards uh, in the ACC. And, you know, Jara can hang with those guys. And when that's – when you switch like that, it means you stay – you keep the ball in front. And Quentin Post, who wants to get into those pick and pops because he he's shooting 43% on threes this season and because he's a really good passer, if you stay out of rotation against those looks, then he's not open on the pick and pop. Your, your defense keeps the ball in front. You flatten out the offense. So his next best guess is to try to then go into the post. And that's when NC State has been, when they've played twice this year, has scram switched. And they've taken either Middlebrooks or Burns, and they've had that player go to – grab post, and then they kick out the guard who's ever switched on the post, whether it's Horn, O'Connell, Morcel, whomever, that person will then go to BC's power forward. Um, and it's it's worked. Like, it's worked, it's worked very well. Um, and then I think, you know, offensively, you got a guy like Burns that can be a, that can be somewhat of like a mismatch problem for those guys to – to handle like are you gonna put Quentin Post on him and risk him maybe getting in foul trouble? Um, you're also pulling, you know, a shot blocker maybe away from the basket because Burns is gonna, you know, uh isolate so much in the mid post and post up there and look for cutters and stuff like that. So I do quite like the the matchup uh against Boston College. As far as UVA goes, like Beekman's tough. Um you think about him on Horn, uh, with you know how Virginia is going to hedge screens and and try to get the, the you know, they're they're automatically they're going to hard hedge ball screens. So how do yeah. you counter that? I think someone like Ben Middlebrooks actually becomes like a big potentially a, like a big piece because he can short roll into space. You know Horn can throw pocket passes to him and he can look to you know make plays on the short roll and he can kick out to Casey Morcel for a three or he can kick out to Jane Taylor for a three. When State beat UVA uh, in Raleigh in, and I guess that was in January, like they were really, really good at attacking those those hard hedges by UVA. You know, they're running. I think it was with O'Connell, and they had they had Horn spaced on the on the right wing, and so just like every time, uh, that was kind of the breakout game for O'Connell too. He had five assists in that yeah. game and two turnovers. Yeah, He's, yeah, and just like every time UVA would get into rotation. Uh, eventually, they'd they'd be able, they, the state could work the ball to to horn out on the wing. Um, so it's like there's stuff you can do against them. Again, I think Middlebrooks becomes like really important 
in in that matchup. I guess the thing, the thought is like with Virginia, like that game will just get into the mud. Like it's going to because they're an elite top end defense. They're not a very good offense, but the way State's playing right now, it kind of feels like they would like a game in the mud. You know, like that they brought Duke into the mud tonight. You know. And uh, and so it kind of thinks like state would would almost do pretty well in that kind of you know low turnover environment with the way their offense is 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 clicking right now and, and really avoiding turnovers. So um, I think it would it would line up well for them you know sort of like matchup wise defensively and it's just like can you eke out enough offense uh, with Horn and Burns and and that's ultimately also why like I think the spot up shooting of Taylor Morcel O'Connell becomes. So, so, so pivotal. Um, and then the last thought would be, like, as far as Virginia goes, like, how are you going to handle guarding Ryan Dunn? Um, because you give, there's some options in terms of, like, who you stash on him, how you're helping off of him. But he can also be, like, a terror as a cutter and a guy that can get on the offensive glass, too. So there's a lot of ways to spin it. Um but State's proven they can beat both of these teams this year. And with Yara, they've got a real – um they've got they've got a really good player in like scheme slash strategy that they can throw at post if boston college is the matchup which i mean i don't know it looks like we're down to what a minute now the game's tied five yeah oh man (laughs) this is crazy well and i and one thing i'll say too and i mean this seems super simplistic but like the difference in those two games to me, and I'm just talking Virginia here, and of course, you know, that, that means the Boston College is going to win this thing. Uh, but <laughs> if you look back at those two games against Virginia, the biggest difference, Michael O'Connell had good games in both of those, you know, had a little better of a game the first game uh, than the second game, actually ended up with 10 points, uh, but had, you know, um, not not as big of a game in, in terms of distributing the basketball the second time around. Is a little better the first time. But the biggest difference in those two games was the performances of DJ Horn and Jaden Taylor, two guys that are just lighting it up right now for NC State. Jaden Taylor, not a, a big game tonight, but, man, again, we talked about it, like the recent success of him. I would expect him to potentially bounce back. Uh, and, and you know, for, for NC State, it's going to come down to those two guys because first matchup, uh, they combined for 29 points. They were both efficient, both shot over 40%. Uh, and then the last game, uh, Jaden Taylor, two of six four, for four points. DJ Horn, three of 12. Uh, all three of oh. those were three pointers. Uh, and he finished with nine points in that second game. It just feels like for, for NC State, it's going to come down to, again, those guys stepping up. But I mean, the same oh. thing. If, if Mo Diara gets the rebounds that you got, that he got against Boston College the first time around, if he continues to play at the, the clip he's playing at right now, and again, uh, he's going to go in with a little extra energy in that one tomorrow after being able to actually eat before the game. Uh, it just feels like this this team has all the makings of a, a team that can that can win this game and try to, regardless of the opponent, uh, and try to get into Saturday. Uh, and we'll see who they end up facing if, if what, they get to that point too. What I would say, I'm, I'm watching. Uh, it's 55-55. Yeah, uh, Jordan Minor. Yeah, Jordan Minor just missed the front of, of a free throw. But what happened? Uh, or not the front end, missed the, yeah, missed the first of two free throws here. But what happened on the defensive possession for UVA before this is a good reminder. Like, BC tried to throw the ball to Quentin Post, like on the left block area. Um, and Minor, they, they didn't come to double team. Minor guarded him one-on-one and blocked his shot, too. So, like, if it is UVA, it does become the, the equation with Burns. Like, how much do they just guard him one-on-one with Minor versus yeah. he was double team? Minor was the difference between those first two games. He was huge. Minor he was, didn't play in the first game, and he, he was – yeah, yeah he, he had kind of gotten going – uh, that was when that was when he kind of got into a little yes. bit of a tear there defensively and got something going offensively. Yep. I mean, yep. I'm looking back at it now. Ten points in that game uh, did have one block, but you know the the um, you know the six offensive rebounds for him to keep them uh, keep those possessions going for them too. Wow! All right, so it was pretty uh, minor missed both for both free throws. Boston College kind of a gross possession. They throw the ball to Quentin Post again on the left block. Uh, he misses then while going for the rebound <laughs> uh, but, uh Madsen uh fouls Jake Groves from UVA he's a very yep. good very good made, shooter he made both of them he made both okay so I'm on YouTube TV I'm a little, I'm, yeah I'm, I'm, a little, I'm a little heavy <laughs> I'm a little heavy it's 57 uh, 55 right now we, this podcast is just turning into breaking down this game but no um <laughs> you, you want to know who they're gonna play <laughs> so, yeah I wasn't um, sure if we were trying to like uh get to that point or if yeah. I was uh 
just absolutely boring everyone to tears by recounting what's no, happening. We've got, uh, yeah, we've got right eight now. seconds left. Oh, oh, I missed the three pointer. So you've you're not going. Oh, are they going to get another one off? Oh, he made it. Oh my gosh, he made it. I don't know if that was a two or three. It looked like a two. Okay, hold on. I'm about to see the. I'm about to. I got the replay yeah, coming up like here. Two. Looked like okay. a two. It at least tied it. Oh at least tied God. it. Yeah, they're saying it's two. So 57 57. You're like, whatever. <laughs> okay, no. so I guess we're not going to have the winner by the end of this one. <laughs> we've, already, we've already talked for 50 minutes. We'll, uh, yeah, we'll have plenty of analysis tomorrow once we're able to, you know, break some of this down. I'll have, you know, stories out, things along those lines, and we'll be able to, you know, break all that stuff down tomorrow, too. Uh, yeah, it's, it's going to OT uh, it as a, a wild finish. And again, hey, regardless of who wins, they'll be coming off of an overtime uh victory and <laughs> however many overtimes this goes to and they'll be coming off a 9 30 game nc state getting a little extra rest after playing a seven o'clock game after playing three straight days in a row uh man i can't imagine how much this would wear down boston college after playing an hey. overtime game after winning the previous two days too everyone also reacted to this boston college shot like he had won the game yeah, yeah. He made like like twenty people with cameras and phones like flooded onto the court, <laughs> like like he hit the game winner. That was incredible. Like Stanford, the band is on the field. <laughs> that was unbelievable. Um, wow, Which was a buzzer beater, regardless. So, <laughs> yeah, it was. I mean, it was still an unbelievable shot, but that was just pretty funny because like people yeah. reacted like he had absolutely like iced the game there. But um, all right, yeah, looking forward to seeing how this game finishes up. And uh, I love this. I'm sorry, I gotta I gotta post this. I love this suggestion here. Bart said, now you could talk about the Anai offense. So uh, let's, <laughs> let's, let's get into NC State football. No, let's not do that. Um, I've got a uh, yeah wouldn't be much help either. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> Bart said the run pass option. Let's 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 talk about that. No uh <laughs> yeah no look again um you know Big win for NC State tonight. Uh, can't you know? Can't overstate that. Regardless of what happens over the next two days, this run has been unbelievable to cover, to discuss, um, everything along those lines. Man, I've uh, you know I've really enjoyed being here in DC, being able to watch all this. Uh, but man, now I've got to go find a uh, I've got to go find another hotel room because I booked all the way through Friday. I don't have a hotel room for tomorrow night for me and my guys. So uh, yeah, we got we got to go figure that out and uh, and then finish up some of these stories. So. Uh, Brian, any final thoughts before you head out of this thing, man? No, uh, I would just say like ACC tournament, man. It's a uh, it's always a treat. Enjoy being up in DC. I uh, wish I was up there, but having fun watching uh, watching games from back at the uh, the home office here in Raleigh. So yeah, everyone just enjoy the games uh, tomorrow. Uh, should be hopefully a good semifinals. Yes, sir. All right. Well, thank you again to everybody for listening. Like I said, we will have plenty more content off of this game, off of whoever NC State's opponent is tomorrow. And, you know, we'll, we'll probably write a little bit about the, uh, you know, the doubt that this team is is playing off of right now uh, because, man, there was a lot of it. And, you know, you walked into the locker room and the first thing you heard everybody saying, no one believed in us, no one believed in us. And, look, that's a, that's yeah. a mark with a lot of teams. They, like they, they can actually say that, too. Like, a lot of teams yeah, like to say literally, that. Quite literally, we were talking on Monday about the fact that this team – you know, I mean, people were literally saying on Monday they wanted to see this team just go ahead and lose on Tuesday to finish this thing. <laughs> and and man, you're you're seeing this team fight off of that and uh and really, you know, make this run. Uh it's it's been a lot of fun, like I said, to 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 capture, to watch. Uh you know, they dropped Kevin, they could drop KJ Keats tonight trying to put the sticker on. They picked him back up and figured oh, it out. God. They then they did like a you know, lifting him up in the air. So uh just <laughs> just a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> I hope KJ's okay. Go. Uh, hope they goes. Hope those guys can go get some uh, some ice cream too, right? And the, yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, man. Good stuff. All right, guys. Well, thank you again to everybody for listening. We will talk to you again soon.